Should Christians be involved in civil government? Well, this is a question many people are asking. What does the Bible say? Well, the Bible teaches that civil government is a divine institution with a legitimate, though very limited, function. Now, when we look at ancient Israel, we certainly see God's people were involved in civil government. Many of them served directly in government. Moses, judges, and kings, the prophets spoke to civil leaders. Moses himself wrote civil laws that were the foundation of Western civilization and organized a government upon a biblical foundation, many of these ideas which were copied by the founders of America. He instituted the election of representatives, constitutionalism, separation of powers, and many other things. So people will say, well, yes, in the Old Testament, Israel certainly was involved in government, but it's different for us today. After all, Jesus in the New Testament doesn't teach anything about government or civil duties. But Jesus actually taught many things about civil government and our civil duties. One, he taught that God created and is sovereign over civil government. He taught the supreme value of all persons over the state. He taught the idea of sovereign jurisdictions and separation of institutions where the state should not encroach upon the affairs of the church or the family. He taught that citizens are to contribute support and submit to limited government. And most importantly, he taught that civil leaders are to be public servants. He also taught it's our duty to resist and protest tyrannical government. So he taught much about civil affairs. Paul and the other apostles taught these same kind of ideas as well. In his letter to the Corinthians, Paul instructs believers in Greece of their duty to elect godly rulers just as they had done back in the Hebrew Republic. Peter affirmed submission to government as a divine institution to punish evildoers and protect the innocent. We even see one gentleman by the name of Erastus who was a fellow minister with Paul, traveled on his missionary team helping to set up new churches, that he went on to go and serve directly in government and politics uh, in Corinth, becoming the city treasurer, as Romans 16, 23 tells us. In fact, there's a first century tablet that's uh, even there today that it says that Erastus, the commissioner of public works, laid this pavement at its own expense. So here was a member of Paul's team that not only established churches, but had no problem switching from the pulpit ministry to the civil ministry. And what a great example he served by paying for the building of a road out of his own pocket. We see that Paul taught in Romans 13, that famous teaching on civil government, he taught such ideas that all authority is from God, that we're to be in subjection to the governing authorities, we're to resist those that re rebel against God's higher law, and that government is a ministry of God to you for good. In fact, to those people who tell me, well, we Christians shouldn't be involved in government, there's a lot of bad people there, and it's ugly business. Well, among other things, I'll tell them, well, God says that civil leaders are to be ministers of God to you for good. And if good people aren't involved, how can it fulfill its biblical function to be a minister of good? In fact, Paul writes, that's how we overcome evil in society is through good rulers. And so we see the Bible tells us the purpose of governments, to protect the righteous, to punish the evildoer, to promote biblical justice, to praise those who do right, and provide an atmosphere of peace within society so that we might carry on the mission that God has for us. And so we see throughout the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, that God's people spoke to the issues of civil government and were involved in civil government as well. And Christians have been involved in civil affairs throughout the Christian era. And it's certainly true in the beginning of the United States of America. In fact, it was Christians who colonized our states, they wrote our laws and constitutions, they started our schools and universities, and they served in leadership in every sphere of life. 
Recognizing this caused John Jay, the first Supreme Court Chief Justice, to say, Providence has given to our people the choice of their rulers, and it is the duty as well as the privilege and interest of our Christian nation to select and prefer Christians for their rulers. He understood it was a Christian people who gave birth to the nation in the first place, and it's only a Christian people who can provide the power necessary for our form of government to function properly. And so most of the leaders in early America were Christians who were applying their faith in service in the civil arena. Now we see pastors also at the time of our American Revolution, they were involved. Now certainly their primary way they got involved was to prepare Christian leaders and Christian citizens. And they did that throughout their sermons, not just the sermons they would teach Sunday morning, but there were many special occasions that they used to speak to these issues of civil affairs. Beginning way back in the 1630s up in New England, they started a tradition of what is called the election sermon. Every year when they had elections, they invite a minister to come, preach a sermon to all the elected officials and citizens. Here's your duty, what the Bible says of how you're to govern, and this is how you as citizens are to fulfill your duty to your community as well. Now, these election sermons were preached for over 250 years. Many of them were published, widely distributed, and became the political textbooks of early America on such topics as civil government and ordinance of God. They even spoke uh, uh, concerning the qualifications for godly officials and so many other areas to instruct and teach and educate the American people and leaders in America of their biblical civil duties. They did this in election sermons, but with special fast day Thanksgiving sermons. They even had execution sermons where they would preach to the crowds of the, here's the, uh, what happens when you violate God's law and even give the convicted criminals a chance to repent of their sins and meet the creator of all things before they were going to stand before him face to face. So they used these occasions to educate the uh, early Americans. But ministers not only educated Americans in their civil duties and civil affairs, but many of them got involved directly. Now, one of those men is this gentleman, Reverend Peter Muhlenberg. Peter Muhlenberg, at the time of the American Revolution, pastored two churches in Woodstock, Virginia. He himself served in civil government. He was a member of the Virginia House of Burgesses, or the legislature in Virginia. And at the end of 1777, he had been at a meeting in Williamsburg. The topic of that legislature was, among other things, the call from General George Washington to, for the states to send troops. Earlier that year, fighting had begun with the British. General Washington was selected to lead the Continental Army, and so he asked for volunteers. So Peter Muhlenberg rode back to Woodstock, Virginia, and on the first Sunday back, he preached a sermon from Ecclesiastes. And he began to read down through that passage of scripture where it says that the Bible tells us there is a time for all things, a time to preach and a time to pray. And then like a trumpet blast, he exclaimed, there is a time to fight, and that time is here now. He then pulled off his pulpit gown. Underneath, it revealed a uniform of a Virginia colonel. He ordered the drums to be beat at the back of the church, calling for enlistments. That day, 300 men marched off with him to go serve under General Washington. Now, there is a statue in the United States Capitol honoring Peter Muhlenberg, and that statue shows this incident with his pulpit gown draped over his shoulders. Underneath, you can see his uniform of a, of a Virginia colonel. Now, Peter Muhlenberg went on to serve in every major conflict of the war with General Washington after Bunker Hill. He became a major general and was there at Yorktown uh, at, at the last major battle of the war as well. 
Now, Peter Muhlenberg had a brother named Frederick Muhlenberg, who was also a pastor serving a church in New York City. And when he had heard what his brother had done of resigning his pulpit and going to march off to fight in the war, he wrote him a letter rebuking him, saying, you would have acted for the best if you had kept out of this business from the beginning. I now give you my thoughts in brief. I think you were wrong. See, many people today try to tell pastors, you can't, shouldn't get involved in civil government and civil affairs. It's wrong for you to do so. That's kind of what Peter's brother was telling him, that he thought it's no business for a pastor to get involved in public affairs and civil affairs, these dirty business of, of everyday life. Well, Peter wrote his brother back and he said, you say, as a clergyman, nothing can excuse my conduct. I am, I am a clergyman, it is true, but I am a member of society as well as the poorest layman, and my liberty is as dear to me as to any man. Shall I then sit still and enjoy myself at home when the best blood of the continent is spilling? Heaven forbid it. Do you think if America should be conquered, I should be safe? Far from it. And would you not sooner fight like a man than die like a dog? I am called by my country to its defense. The cause is just and noble. And so far am I from thinking that I am wrong, I am convinced it is my duty so to do, a duty I owe to God and my country. Well, the next year, the British marched into New York City. There were 19 churches in New York City. 10 of them were completely destroyed and the others were, were desolated in some way. And one of the churches destroyed was Frederick Muhlenberg's church. Now, after this, he began to think, well, maybe my brother Peter is right after all, for if we do nothing, we won't have the freedom to worship God that we have now. So after the war was over and the new constitution went into effect, Frederick Muhlenberg, Peter's brother, by that time had moved back to Pennsylvania, his original home, and he was selected as a member of the first Congress of the United States. He then traveled to New York City where the first Congress assembled. There in New York City, all of the other representatives from the states elected him as the first Speaker of the House of Representatives. So the first Speaker of the House of Representatives was a minister inspired by his minister brother to get involved in civil affairs. And it's Frederick Augustus Muhlenberg's signature that's on the Bill of Rights. And his painting hangs today right outside the U.S. House of Representatives. So this is a great example of the role that pastors and Christians played in the birth of America and in the advance of civil liberty in history. So should Christians be involved in civil government? The answer is overwhelmingly yes. The Bible teaches we should. The history of America affirms that without the pastors and Christians' involvement, there would be no America as we know it today. America today needs that the, the Christians to rise up, to get involved, to fulfill their mission, to bring godly principles to bear in the civil arena.